Thank you, Ashley. Again, welcome everyone to today's presentation on Autodesk Inventor Tolerance Analysis. Just jump right into this and get it going. Again, my name is Kindred Cooper. I am an MCAD Solutions Engineer with Hagerman and & Company. And in the background running the Q&A, we have Clayton Petmiller, also an MCAD Solutions Engineer with Hagerman & Company. Uh, obviously, uh, well, this slide is for uh, those who possibly can't hear me, but it also showcases for the meeting manager that we use, there is a questions uh, panel where you can enter your questions. Uh, that will be used or focused on uh, at the end of today's webinar, but you can use it throughout and Clayton will address those questions as quickly as possible. Hagerman and Company, just a brief little update about us. Um, we are scattered from coast to coast. We have offices covering the entire United States. We are heavily focused uh, around the, or not focused, but kind of centralized around central Midwestern United States, but we do cover coast to coast, uh, coast, to coast territories. Uh, our technical staff is field experience. So Clayton and myself and the rest of the engineers with Hagerman and Company, we have been in the muck and the mud in the trenches with with you guys uh, for many years. I forget what the cumulative experience is uh, for all of our engineers, but I think the last thing I heard was close to 150 years of combined experience with everybody. And uh, we've been in this business for over 25 years doing software sales and, and implementation experience. Um, we uh, do, we've done impl implementations from the beginning and we do a lot of them uh, every month. So getting to the meat of all this, the tolerance analysis, what is the whole purpose of it? Well, it's an add-in for Inventor and it's an add-in for 2019.1. You have to be running 2019.1 in order to download, install, and run the tolerance analysis add-in. Uh, if you don't th have that, you install the dot one add in or the dot one update and then you'll have access to the tolerance analysis utility. But the purpose of it is to look at your design and be able to give you a clear picture of what is in spec and what is out of spec. And if you have a design that is out of spec, it can actually show you what items are contributing to that out of spec situation. Now, this can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. But the takeaway from this is you have to focus on where you want to look. There are certain things that might play into a design or play into a setup that actually aren't playing into that tolerance stack up or, out of, or not playing into that uh, um, out of spec situation. So you have to look at things in a separate light. You have to isolate each area and look at it individually. And what it's looking at is dimensional variation. What causes that? There's a lot of different things that cause it. Now, tool wear is an obvious one that, that comes into play. Operational temperature of the mechanism, of the setup, of the machining itself. The component moving during machining or even moving during operation can be one of the uh, situations. Machine precision. Maybe your machine is old or it's been a long time since it's been calibrated and it just, things go out of calibration. It happens. Then lastly, of course, is the human error that plays into all this and the setup of the machine. Maybe they misread the dimension. Maybe they misread the print. Uh, misprogrammed machine is another option. So there's a lot of things that play into it that we are all well aware of. And the inventor utility can help you figure out in the design if that's playing into it. So one of the advantages of using this utility Obviously, you can cut down on physical prototypes. That's a, a big ticket item for all of us. How do we know this thing is going to work? We can set it up virtually in the, in the system. We can do animations and movements and position reps and things like that with Inventor. But how do we know it's actually going to work? What do we all do? We go out to the shop, we build one, and we do another test there. The downside is we have historically and continue to rely on that physical product and physical first run test to be the end all be all. 
that's going to tell us if things are machined right, if things are positioned right, if things have the right materials. By then, it's almost too late. If we find a defect or an error in the design at that point, our costs are going to start to climb dramatically. That's the wrong place to find these things. The best place to locate it is in the CAD software. Yes, engineers are not cheap, but they're also not the most expensive thing in the entire process. So finding it in the computer and making the changes there, pennies on a dollar, if, if that much. So that's your biggest bang for the buck. Another reason we want to do this is to increase the product performance. Uh, can we reduce our tolerances, not make them so fine, which is going to save us cost on the machining, Plus, it can help with the material, with the design to increase some of its performance. If we're machining it too thin because of those tolerances, that piece may wear out faster. Whereas if we give it a little bit more leeway, or for that matter, we take the tolerance from another mating piece that has more meat and can sacrifice the material. There's another situation. Uh, reducing the warranty issues, again, goes back to can we make this a little bit thicker and it not wear out so much? That plays a huge role. What a lot of people don't realize with a tolerance stack up utility like this is the dollar amount that you can directly relate to it. I'm going to try to remember to do that when we go into the actual demo portion. We can take these numbers and we can tie them to a real dollar amount and see, okay, maybe this is an acceptable, acceptable amount of failures or an acceptable performance. Uh, capability of this process and this design. We're going to have some failures out of it. What is it going to cost us? You can get that out of this utility. Looking at some of the traditional ways, we've all done this. You take your dimensions, you spread them out in Excel, you start running some fancy equations and maybe you just print it out and you handwrite it or you type it in. Uh, we've all sat there with our TI calculator and done the calculations. Again, the physical prototypes come up. Um, the software applications, some that are out there, little freebies and stuff that you can use and, and even trying to use Inventor as it is to help you with the tolerance stack ups without the utility. You know, there's that option too. Uh, one of them that's not even on here. What have we all done? I know I used to do it. Sit down with the print, sit down with the piece, have one lead pencil with gray uh, lead in it, another lead pencil with red lead in it, and then a yellow highlighter. What do you do? You start measuring, the good dimensions get a yellow mark, the red dimensions get a big red circle, or they get wrote down in red, so you know visually on that print, where's my problem? Then what happens? We've got a problem. We found it, this dimension, out of spec. What's the next question that comes up? We've all heard this question. Is it really that critical? That's That's not the right question to answer. You know, you need, before that question even comes up, you need to know if that dimension is critical or not. Do we need to tolerance this dimension? Do we need fine tolerance on that dimension? Or can we do a general tolerance? That's where the software is going to help you. <clears throat> so with Inventor's Tolerance Analysis Utility, again, you have to be running 2019.1 in order to download and install this utility. Uh, it is fully integrated into Inventor, and it is a 1D analysis, one direction analysis. I don't want to say one dimension, but one direction analysis. That's a little bit misleading because you can do multiple directions. You're probably thinking, well, wait a minute, you just said one direction. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll show you when I get in there, but it's one direction at a time. You can have as many analyses in your assembly but each analysis works in one planar direction at a time. So you can have one going in the Y direction, a different analysis going X, and another analysis going Z, and another one going somewhere in between. <clears throat> so you can have multiple analyses or multiple stack ups uh, configured. Uh, it calculates the effects of your dimensions from your geometry and the tolerances you put into that. And it provides some feedback. You've got a lot of different ways of looking at this information. It's going to give you worst case. That's the default report that it gives. Uh, then you can also have it uh, feedback residual sum of squares or, or root sum squares. Uh, then statistical results such as CPK, sigma values, 
defects per million opportunities and percent of yield. Uh, you can also generate a report using that information showing what your stack up reported and where it performs in the process. <clears throat> okay, so we got a real quick polling question that I'm gonna ask Ashley to bring up for you folks. And what we wanna know is, what is your method of tracking and reporting the accuracy? It's layman's terms, I think the actual question is a little bit different, but what are you using within your organization? Are you using a worst case report? Are you looking at uh, root sum square and, and, and or CPK? Uh, are you looking at a sigma value? Are you looking at DPMO or are you looking at a percent yield? Uh, so we will give a minute or two for everybody to answer that. And let's see. So the actual question, uh, what metric does your location use to predict and or track out of spec, such as defective parts? And again, worst case or CPK or uh, root sum, uh, sigma values, defects per million or a different metric, an other metric. Let me give just another few seconds. And we're gonna look at these results too, because Clayton and I must, we got together and, and talked about this a little bit, and we're both very, very curious on what the spread is gonna be. I have my prediction, and I don't know if it's gonna be right or not, but I'm gonna say other might be the highest category. Okay, Ashley, if you wanna go ahead and close that poll and show okay. the results. Okay, now how do I get to see? It should just, can you see the results now? I can see a little tiny window. Um, well. Um, hmm. It says it's showing to everyone. I can tell you. Do you see it? Yes, I do. I can read them out to you. Worst case, 45%. CPK or RSS, 26%. Sigma, 4%. DPMO, 2%. And other, 23%. Oh, I was second. <laughs> I, I thought the other would have it. I really did. Okay, so um, worst case, and majority of them are using worst case. Okay, that's, that's very good information uh, to know. All right, so let's continue on. With the software, the add-in, how do we get it? Where does it come from? Okay, so if you're running 2019.1, here's what you have to do. Now, there's, there's two different workflows. I'm going to try to show both of these, so bear with me while I pull up this. Okay, so you've got, you've got your um, Autodesk login, and it could be your personal account, your corporate account. If you're running a network license for Inventor and the tolerance analysis, then your account administrator will be the only one who can see it in the downloads in the Autodesk account. They'll have to log in, they'll have to uh, download it, but then they also have to give you access to it. So even though they can see it, doesn't mean you can run it. Even if they download it, doesn't mean you can run it. They have to go into the license and, and allow that. Uh, so if you're looking at a standalone seat, when you log in, what you should see is something very similar to this. When you're looking at your all products and services portion of your account page, they're under or within the inventor section. So it's not under your inventor flyout. It's not under your inventor pro. It's actually a separate line item under products and services, inventor tolerance analysis. It'll jump out at you. And you can expand that and you can download the appropriate version for whatever version of software you need. Uh, as you see, the 2021 download is already available. Now, what we're running today is 2020. I don't have the uh, 21 installed and configured yet, but there's no change from the 2019.1 to the 2020 to the 2021. All right, so now let's actually get in here and look at this thing. Okay, so. I wanna start back at the basics and something that a lot of people don't realize they have the capability of already. I'm gonna show you 
a workflow not even using the utility. I'm not using the inventor tolerance analysis utility. I'm using basic inventor and I'm using the tools that we have to adjust dimensions and include tolerances. So looking at this particular block design, very basic design, the dimensions used to create it, I've got them named. I've got a block length, it's about two inches long. I've got a block height, it's one inch, and then I've got a cutout diameter that is one inch. And you'll notice looking at the parameters, there's a tolerance column over here that routinely gets overlooked uh, by users. What this actually does is it tells Inventor how to evaluate the dimension. Now, by default, everything gets evaluated to a nominal value. Okay, so, and that's how we typically teach and instruct people to design. You know, if you've got a, a half inch diameter bolt and a three eighths inch uh, or half inch diameter hole and a three eighths diameter bolt, you put those together in the real world, what happens? They kind of wobble around, right? There's, there's clearance in there. But in the CAD software, you're not necessarily gonna model in that wobbly effect. You're just gonna model everything true to center. That's a nominal condition. Same thing for dimensioning. You got your block, it's two inches by one inches. You're gonna model it to a nominal setup. Now, what you can do on any dimension because as I mentioned, they are all set by default. I've been here playing around with this, that's why these are different. But by default, they're all set to a nominal value. So this one's two inches long and one inch tall. What you can do on a sketch dimension or even a feature dimension is you can right click on that dimension, go to dimension properties, and on the dimension settings tab, there is a tolerance section. There's also the precision for the decimals you're looking at, but down below that is the tolerance section. Everything is set out of the box to default. Well, default usually just refers to a company standard, you know, whatever you have posted or whatever you beat your employees in the head with. Here, you can actually configure what you want that tolerance to be. So one of the most, the two most common actually, are symmetric and deviation. So if I look at symmetric, then I can say, well, we can give this a plus or minus value. We can say, well, let's do plus or minus 10 thousandths. That's on the length of this thing. And then here you can also choose the evaluation. This is a second area you can set the evaluation. Again, by default, it's evaluating to nominal, but you can choose to evaluate it to the minimum or to the upper or even to the average, to the median. So I'm gonna leave it at 10 thousandths, say okay. And you'll notice the dimension changes. When you have a sketch dimension with a tolerance, it's going to show that listed. Now that only shows if you have your dimension displayed down at the bottom, if you have that set to the tolerance option. If you're looking at the expression, no, it's not gonna do that. You have to actually set it to the tolerance. The tolerance dimension setting is also the default setting. So out of the box, you're not gonna have to do much of anything to get it to show up like this. You just have to go into the dimension properties, set what kind of tolerance you want to look at or evaluate and how much, and it'll show up just like that. Now, here's where this plays into hand. I'm going to finish my sketch and I'm just going to take a measurement. Just measure that edge along the bottom, two inches, dead on. Okay, let's change the evaluation. I'm going to go into my parameters. There's my block length change it from nominal, I'm gonna to go to the minimal. Say done, doesn't really look like it changed, but right click, do a measure, measure that edge, 1.990. So it is actually reflecting that dimensional change, even though in the sketch, the nominal is still shown. Same thing if I go to a max, evaluate it to the maximum. Do another right click and a measure, same deal. Now 2.010. The inventor tolerance analysis utility does not require this, but it makes life easier if you do this. Um, GDNT also comes into play if you're using the uh, GDNT utilities out of Inventor. They will also pull over into the tolerance analysis utility. <clears throat> now, does the model itself change based on these inputs and it does if i look at the circle dimension here the circle cut um, there's no tolerance on it 
yet. But if I do a dimension properties here and I do a deviation, let's say uh, plus, we'll say 10 thousandths and minus five thousandths. Apply that. Of course, the dimension changes when I finish the sketch. Nothing's changed on the geometry because it's still being evaluated to the nominal. Let's look at the mating component. I've got a dowel pin sent over here. Same deal. I've got a dimension here. If I put a tolerance on that, we'll set this to a deviation on the dowel pin, and I'll say we'll go a maximum of five thousandths and a minimum of ten thousandths. Finish the sketch. Again, in the parameters for the dowel pin, it's set to nominal. Actually, it's set to max, so I'm going to set it to nominal. And then I'm going to take those two and I'm going to put them together in an assembly. Now looking at the assembly, everything looks nice and kosher. No, no problems, nothing, no red flags or anything are going to be thrown. If I take some measurements, measure my block. Okay, I didn't change it. It's still showing uh, two and ten thousandths over. If I measure my circle, it's one inch there. If I measure the cutaway for that circle, it's one inch there, one inch diameter. Now, at the assembly level, you cannot go in and access the parameters of the piece parts. And there's kind of a debate, is that good or bad? But you can't go in there and access it without any kind of custom programming or anything like that. Just out of the box, Inventor does not have that workflow. And there's reasons for that. But what I can do is I can go back to the dowel pin bring up the parameters, and I'm going to set the dowel pin to maximum tolerance, maximum diameter. So let's check that. I'm going to measure it, make sure. It's now one and five thousandths over. Perfect. I'm going to save that. I'm going to go to my little cutaway block and do the same thing. For the cut for that dowel, I'm going to change that, change the evaluation for that. And I'm going to evaluate that to the minimum value so that when I take a measurement here perfect exactly what I wanted to see 0.995 so technically speaking the dowel and this cutaway should not go together well, at least not without enormous amounts of force when I look at my test assembly everything looks peachy right well when I do an update you'll notice my interference edge is now gone on the model the model changes to show you and reflect those dimensions. Let me go to a wireframe hidden edges. And it's it's very small because that's what my tolerances were. There's, there's not a lot of deviation between them. And you'll see right here, you'll see a hidden line back behind that dowel pin. That's the cutaway of that block. So the assembly does reflect those tolerance changes, those tolerance evaluations. And you could put this on a drawing and do the same thing. You could do a basic stack up using Inventor as is. But the downside is you don't get the matrices to show you the impact of this. And it can be very difficult to find. I personally know from experience doing this and running stack ups using Inventor's out of the box workflow like this. Yes, it's helpful but you can still miss some things. And had a uh, past experience uh, come up to where that's what happened to us. We, we missed it over five parts and they were out of top. They were all within tolerance for themselves, but when you put it together, the assembly wouldn't go together, but everything was within tolerance for itself until you started stacking up. So once we put Inventor into the mix and started running these stack ups, we were able to see it. But even in standard workflow, it didn't jump out to us. So you do have this capability out of the box to at least do some minimal examination of your tolerances. And as I mentioned, you can put tolerances on a sketch dimension. You can also put tolerances on a feature. So for example, the uh, extrusion length here, uh, what you can do is you can, you're, you're not gonna be able to get to it through the dialogue. 
there, there's nothing here to come in and, and invoke a tolerance on the extrude. On the whole command, there is. If you drill a hole, there is an option on the diameter uh, value to come in and put in a tolerance. So some of the dialogues have it, some of them don't. In a situation where you can't get to a tolerance option through the dialog, all you have to do is right click on the feature, show the dimensions, it'll give you a dimension there and you can do a dimension properties on that guy. So as soon as I grab it, do a dimension properties and I get back to the tolerance box. So if there's no sketch that's giving you that value, such as an extrusion length, you can still get to it by showing the dimensions, selecting it and doing the dimensions property there. Okay, so that's the out-of-the-box workflow. Going in here and defining those tolerances will help you in the tolerance analysis engine. So if I look at this particular assembly that we've got right here, I call it an engineer's fidget spinner if you want to, but we've got four blocks. They're all the same, half inch thick. Um, each block has inherent within it. Um, the tolerances are built and defined. Uh, so that I can pull those straight in. So if I look at this and go into, you know, there's nothing on the sketch. It's going to be on the ex uh, extrusion itself. There is a tolerance on the half inch thick uh, extrusion, plus or minus three thousandths. Every one of the blocks has that same tolerance. Then on the clamp bracket, where the tolerance actually is, is on the source sketch that makes the profile, the two inches. So that particular one has a tolerance of plus or minus 10 thousandths. Let's take this and go into the tolerance analysis engine. So where does that show up? Where does that utility come into play? Once you have it installed and configured on the environments ribbon, you will see a tolerance analysis icon. If you do not see that icon, if you've ran the installer, everything went as you would expect, no errors. If you don't see that icon, go to the tools ribbon and go to your add-ins. And what you're looking for in the add-ins is titled Inventor Tolerance Analysis. Make sure the checkboxes for loaded, unloaded is checked and load automatically. Make sure both of those are turned on. Uh, you may have to turn them on, hit OK, kill Inventor, and restart it but by then it should always show up on the environments ribbon. So when I load the tolerance analysis engine, might take you a second for the dialog or the, um, uh, the prompt window over here at the side to show up. Uh, but what you've got is you've got a results or a summary tab that displays and you're going to build a new stack up. So when I invoke new stack up, what I'm actually going to be looking at with this thing is I'm going to be looking at the end face of block number one and the inside face of the clamp. Right now, that clearance is zero. And I want to see if with all of my stack ups, will that still maintain a zero or will they exceed each other? So pay very close attention to your prompts. It's going to guide you exactly on what to pick. So what I'm gonna do is actually pick the faces that's gonna define the critical dimension. I'm gonna pick the outside face of block one, and I'm gonna pick the inside face of the clamp. That defines that critical gap, even though there's no gap, that's, that's what we're looking at to see if one shows up. Uh, the next thing is you're just gonna pick an annotation plane. This is just you know, what orientation you wanna use to display the dimensions. That's all it is, and it's just graphical. So I'll choose one of the origin planes. You can choose one of the flat faces of the model if you wish. And you'll see right here, it puts a zero dimension. So I'm gonna place that out here in space. Now, there's two workflows that come into play here. You can either have the software automatically daisy chain the pieces together and figure out all the relationships, or you can manually select them. Here's the difference. You'll notice right here in the heads up display, it's got assembly constraints and joints. That's the method of detection. And here it says one path found. So when I look at that, it actually found how these blocks are related to each other with some 
face mates. I've got face mates and center line constraints lining all of this up. The workflow issue that I have is some of my older models are built constrained in various ways and this automated process does not 100% of the time find all the relationships. So it does require a little bit, the tiniest little bit of forethought and planning. Hey, I may want to do tolerance analysis on this, so let's make sure I build some constraints so it can find this relationship. Eh, I'm not, I'm not going to be thinking about that during the design phase. So the chances of this automated utility working for me, working for me every time is very slim. Instead, what I'll do is I'll use the select method. And what that allows you to do is just go through here and pick the pieces you want to work with. We'll, we'll look at the select method in a minute. Right now, we're going to look at the automated uh, tool to show you how fast this can be if things work out. So it finds that path, all of these face mates that are constraining these pieces. Select that as the path to use and say OK. And boom, 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 puts in all of the dimensions for me for each piece and the overall gap finds everything and I've got my new stack up analysis over here. Now, you're getting a lot of information and the downside with a lot of information is a lot of times it can confuse us and, and scare us a little bit and that's natural. We have to break this down. We have to look at it on a case by case basis. So what you're actually, what we did is we ran one stack up. That's what's shown here. And when I expand that, that's when you get all of the detailed information. It breaks it down by piece. So you're seeing block one here, that's of course number one, block two, block three, and block four each have their own areas. Then you have the clamp bracket also broke down. Now, in each of these pieces, it breaks down the information for what's the nominal value, what's the nominal dimension of what we're looking at. This is where the 1D, one direction, one dimension comes in we're going down the x-axis based on the UCS of the model. We're going down the x-axis. I cannot tell the software we'll analyze x and y simultaneously. It doesn't work that way. It's only working in one direction. I can come here, start another new stack up, pick some other things to measure in the y direction or the z direction, and I can have a stack up for each direction. That's what I meant earlier by saying it's one direction, but it works in multiple directions. You can have multiple stack ups in your model. So looking at the nominal, this is the nominal value from each of the components. Then you have the tolerance. It's showing you the tolerance is built into the model. Now there's some, some settings that come with this to where you can say, okay, well, if we're working in millimeters or inches, here's my default tolerances on dimensions that don't have tolerances. So you're not necessarily required to do a dimension properties and invoke and set a tolerance, but it can make life a lot easier, especially going forward on multiple designs. When you're using that piece in five, 10, 50, 100 assemblies, it's already got tolerances built into it. So you can set these defaults for untoleranced dimensions here in the settings. You can also choose what your default target display is. Is it worst case? Is it root sum? Is it statistical? And then you can set your limits for the, the statistical portions, um, your CPK, uh, well, not your limit, but your goal, uh, 1.0, your sigma, sigma of three, you know, so on and so forth. So you can set these values and then looking at the tolerance, you don't have to take what comes from the model. You can tweak it. You can say, okay, well, this is what the model gives me, but let's play around with it a little bit and see where it is. Then down at the bottom, you get a stack up. Now you'll notice the stack up is zero. And you might be thinking, why, why is a stack up zero? This thing is two inches wide. What it's doing is it stacks up the overall and subtracts the stack up of the internal. That gives us the zero. Then you have the objective. Now the stack up is given by the software's measurements, whatever the software determines. The objective is defined by you. So what this actually allows you to do is say, okay, well, our objective for the gap is greater than or equal to zero. And as I make changes, our worst case plot will show an update based on that. Now, looking at this, our worst case does not look good. We've got half of it going to be in the red and half of it going to be in, in the good. So 
if we make a hundred of these, good chance when the, with the right conditions, 50 will be bad and 50 will be good. Again, we're looking at a worst case scenario. We can change how this is reported and analyzed and displayed. If I expand right here under the objectives, I can pull down the arrow and expand it to say, well, let's look at the residual sum or the root sum squares. When I look at that, I get a different type of chart with a little bell curve in there. And again, it's still showing me about half is gonna fail. Uh, we do have a mean calculation and we do have a standard deviation of seven thousandths of an inch. You know, based on these tolerances, I would expect you know five to seven thousandths. Now I can also change that to look at the statistical breakdowns. CPK, for example, this is my preference on how to look at something. Uh, this gives me a, a more clear picture of what the process is actually doing. Actual CPK that we're looking at is zero, not, not good at all. Our objective is a 1.6 CPK based on these numbers. And again, the mean and standard deviation is not gonna change based on these different plots. We can also look at our sigma. Yeah, zero sigma, we're, we're dead in the middle, boys. We're, we're not gaining ground and we're not losing ground. So our target sigma or our objective sigma for this based on our numbers should be around four to five. And that's a very good sigma rating. So something's going on that's killing us on this. And then we can also look at this in a percent of yield. Again, we're looking at a 50% yield. Half of these things stand the chance of being bad. And then if you look at defects per million opportunities, of course, that's directly related to sigma value, but does display slightly different. Again, out of a million pieces we're gonna make, 500,000 are gonna be bad. So let's start playing around with these numbers to see if we can't tweak this up. As it is right now, our design is not in a good, good standing, really. So the first thing we probably wanna look at is, okay, which one is the biggest cause of this? And down at the very bottom, there is a, con a contributions tab for this window. And it'll break down to show you which pieces, based on these numbers, which pieces is the most influential, whichever one has the highest bar. <laughs> well, in this case, they're all even Steven, so take your pick. So probably one thing we want to do is we want to mess around with the tolerances of the individual blocks. Right now, they're plus or minus 10 thousandths. We don't really want to do that. Let's change this, and we're going to say let's do a plus, right now they're symmetric. Uh, 10 thousandths. We'll do a plus minus and we'll say plus zero for each one of them, but they can go down 10 thousandths. So I just have to change each one of them pretty quick on just four pieces. And as I'm changing, check out the bar at the top or the uh, graph at the bottom. See, it's already changing and updating based on these numbers that I'm plugging in. Now, we're looking at defects per million opportunities. We're at 11 out of a million parts that we run. 11 are gonna be bad based on these numbers. Much better, much, much, much better. So let's break this down and look back at, say, sigma. You know, we've gone up to a 4.2 sigma. We're almost at our 4.9 objective that we should be. So that's a really good result, really good sigma. If we look at the CPK for the process, 1.4, again, we're real close to that 1.6. We do have some here in the bell curve that's kind of, giving us some problems. That's where those 11 pieces come in. Our root sum is looking good and our worst case shows just the tiniest little bit of red. Okay, again, worst case out of a million of these, 11 stand a chance of being bad. No guarantee of that. All right, so at least now we, we've started tweaking this in the right direction. So what is contributing to this red? What is contributing to that 11 pieces, those 11 pieces being bad? look at the contributions tab and we can see it's the clamp now we, we've tweaked the tolerances on the blocks now the clamp has the issue and we may have control over some of these we may have control over one or two that's where of course you want to focus if there's any tooling out there that's already been made that needs to be your last stop because that's going to be the most expensive change you make especially from a vendor but if it's something you own and something that's in-house that's where you have your most control and flexibility so the clamp, we make the clamp, we buy the blocks. So in this case, um, we were trying to be generous with the blocks and saying, oh yeah, you don't have to be so precise and we were trying to save a little bit of money. So now we have to come back and say, well, let's make it max and you can thin them down a little bit. So now with the clamp, we make the clamp, let's control what happens here. 
we're looking at a plus minus uh, a symmetric uh, tolerance on that so let's open it up let's say minus nothing and we'll say plus we'll open this up at least five thousand that's pretty and eh, let's say ten thousand let's leave it at ten five thousand is pretty precise so now we've gotten back to where everything's even contribution if i look at my results my worst case is looking phenomenal i'm gonna bet we have a sigma of six or greater yeah 6.41 and defects per million we have zero those are the two main ones that i like to look at uh, they they paint a very clear picture for myself looking at worst case of course you can break this down now what happens if we look at this and say okay well maybe we'll say a max of five thousandths and we'll say a minimum of we'll say two thousandths we start to get some show back up all right so let's break this down again let's look back at defects per million we're still in the zero because again worst case does not guarantee that any are going to be bad so we can we can probably fudge with this a little bit more okay maybe we go down three thousandths or maybe we go down you know plus or minus five plus or minus five thousandths would work we get down to plus or minus five thousand to look like the bracket and everything predictability wise everything's still looking good so maybe we can ease up on the max tolerance of some of these blocks you know maybe give them an allowance of five thousand just making that tiny little change we start to get an issue so right now just one block being five thousandths out of tolerance everything else being within tolerance we've got 13 pieces bad out of a million so if we are doing small parts manufacturing and we are making a million of these let's break this down into some real numbers here's where the cost effect comes in so yeah you can do this and run an analysis on your design and figure out your dimensions what's going to work what's going to not let's break it down to dollars and cents we're making these and let's say they they cost us thirty dollars to make and we sell them for fifty dollars whatever these things are and out of a million of them 13 are going to be bad. Well, we don't make a million. We don't make a million of these in a year. We make 500,000. Okay, well, you know, cut that in half, of course. So we're going to have six and a half bad. Well, let's just round and say six. Well, clear it out. We got six of them. They cost us $30. Okay, easy math. Six times 30. 30 uh, six of them are going to be bad. It's only 180 bucks out of the year. Not too bad. What if we got to rework it? You know, maybe we can go in here and we can grind it. So now we've added another $30 plus, say, $20 to rework it. Okay, so 20 times 6 plus, you know, the other 180. So if we've got six of these that have gone bad, they've already cost us $300 to fix them. In something like this, that's easy money to eat. Every shop can eat $300. When this number equals that salary of a worker, that's when things start to get a little bit messy. Not every shop has the budget to eat a worker's salary for sitting there wasting time, right? That's really what these are. They'd be wasted pieces. So if we've got 13 of these things costing us $30 a piece, and let's say we make, you know, five million a year, there's nineteen hundred dollars that we just wasted. You know, we've lost that that money lost that production and, and sacrificed our lead times for this so this is how you can relate it directly back to dollars you can use these tools to predict okay we're going to have this many bad or we could have this many bad how much could that cost us and in the right perfect storm can we eat that money none of us want bad parts but it's inevitable again tool wear machine variation operator setup it's inevitable no process on the planet can maintain six sigma indefinitely there's at least a one and a half sigma variation right everything's going to fluctuate for various reasons as that sigma variates or as that sigma fluctuates if it goes down there's more money you're going to end up paying if it goes up there's more money you're going to save you know it's kind of hard to predict sometimes so what this software actually does is it doesn't look at and this is where it can be a little confusing it doesn't look at the two inches versus the half it looks at the gap it looks at that first measurement you take and we don't always think in those terms usually we're thinking okay two inches plus five thousandths minus ten add this and we're thinking the overall 
we're not thinking about this little isolated gap. At least it's not how we traditionally just out of the box start thinking. So th let's look at this in another model that has a gap. And we're gonna look at the different selection method in this one as well. So again, jump back into tolerance analysis. I've already got a stack up that idea, but I'm gonna make another new stack up. And with the new stack up, measuring the same things, it's still gonna be the gap from the block face here and the gap from the inside of the clamp. I'll put my annotation plane on the front. Let's come up here and drop it. And again, it found the assembly constraints, but I'm not gonna use that method. Most commonly what I'm using is the select method, again, because the constraints I've used don't necessarily get a good daisy chain. Now, if you use the assembly and it gets you most, but it misses a few pieces, you always have the option of adding a feature or adding offsets to include those. <clears throat> so if I use the select method, I wanna come in and add the components. So it's already got the first component kind of ghosted out. It sees, hey, we're working with this guy. What else do we wanna work with? Well, I wanna work with block two, block three, block four, and the clamp. So I'm selecting each one of them. When I complete my selection and there's nothing else to select related to this direction of gap, then it comes back and it's, it wants me to isolate relationships between these components because it's not looking at the constraints, so it has no idea how these things stack together or fit together. So the prompt is telling me select a face, edge, vertex, or point from block one that mates with block two. So here's block one, the back face, of it is what mates with block two. So I'll just pick the back face of block one, and then the front face of block two, then it steps over. Now you pick the face from block two that relates to block three. And very quickly, this comes becomes super monotonous. All right, so once you establish all of those relationships, then we define the face of block four as it mates or relates to the clamp. Okay, well that's the back face of block four and the inside face of the clamp. Got them all, but what you see there is the mate constraints that uh, it found earlier or found previously. So you can do it the automated way or you can do it the manual way by selecting them. You just gotta watch your prompts when you're doing the selection, the manual selection option. So say okay, you get the same breakdown, the same information, and the same capabilities and same charts. Uh, looking at the process as it is, everything's looking good, nothing is exceeding that gap size. If I break this down to root sum, or look at sigma or CPK. You can see on the bell curves, you can see your upper and lower spec limits. Um, that's part of the reason why I like these is we can more clearly see where's that bell, where's our distribution at. <clears throat> now, the utility gives you these numbers, gives you this information, and the nice thing about it is it stays stitched and embedded in your part or your assembly, because you can run this on single piece parts too but it stays embedded within the assembly file. With some of the other utilities uh, that come with Inventor like uh, Nastran or stress analysis, frame analysis, um, BIM content, stuff like that, a lot of times it'll make a separate folder where your model file exists, but it'll make a subfolder and put in some files in there. It'll put in some support documents and XMLs and setting files and results files for like stress analysis or Nastran, for example. So it's separate entities. Whereas to tolerance analysis, no, it's all embedded in that model. So you send that uh, assembly model and part file, it goes with it, it's right there. They've got access to what you did. You don't have to send anything separate. Nice and clean, works. The other thing is you can generate a report. Now you can take a snapshot, which basically is your, your, your opening slide of your report, if you will, but you just zoom out, pan your model, focus in on what you need to focus on. Okay, we need to focus on that gap, so I'll just look flat to the front and zoom in a little bit. And then I'll just take a snapshot, and that becomes the opening slide of your presentation or of your report. So when I generate the report, just ask you, okay, where do you wanna save this? Now, it will create, this report is not going to be embedded or linked to your model file. It will create a separate uh, subfolder and report file for that. So now what we're looking at is 
we've got an HTML version of the report. It gives you that snapshot that we took and then gives you a breakdown of the summary. We've got two stack ups in this particular uh, assembly design that we ran. It's given us our nominals, our objectives of each, the quality test results in CPK, what the results were, predicted quality, and the number of DIMMs, number of dimensions examined or included in that report. So stack up one, there's the first shot with the results of it, and it's given the CPK for that. Now the chart that it includes is the chart that you have active when you generate the report. Uh, unfortunately, you're only able to include one chart. <clears throat> Not that you would necessarily need more than one, but um, so here we're looking at the CPK. It also gives you the contributions, so somebody can break down and say, well, okay, well, wait a minute, the, the bracket is showing you know 40% contribution. Can we tweak that a little bit more and get a better CPK or better sigma or whatever? Uh, Stack up two gets its own separate breakdown, as you see, breakdown for the individual pieces, the nominals, the tolerances for those and the CPK results of that. Pretty straightforward. You can have this be as simple as you need. It can also get a lot more complex. I don't know that there's a limit for how many pieces you can include in this stack up. Um, I, I guess it's you know, a limitation of the design. I've not seen any kind of limit uh, identified or even mentioned. So I would imagine if you've got 500 parts and you wanna look at a stack up, that's a bit extreme, but you know, I, I guess the capability is there. Uh, the most I've looked at is about 12, you know, and, and once you get over 10, it starts to get really blurry. So keep your analyses kind of minimal. Uh, that's going to help you. And again, just break them down. You can run as many of these as you want. You know, if you've got 500 pieces and you need stack ups for all 500, break it down into segments, you know, break it down into 50 segments if you can, you know, or more or less. And then just kind of streamline. You can even break these down or identify these as certain uh, stack ups. Um, gap for washer, you know, that could be one name of the stack up. Another one could be overall uh, fit dimension. You know, if it's having to fit into a confined space, into an enclosure or something like that, you can rename these stack ups and they'll be reflected in the report as such. Okay, with that, we will step into the Q&A. Clayton, how's our question and answer portion looking? Uh, we're clear. I think we've pretty much answered everything that came in. Uh, the most popular question, you mentioned 29.1 or 2019.1 for a version. It's That version was the first. Every version after that also has it. Yes, uh, that's I, good clarification. Sorry, I did, did not make that clarification. Um, a, every version after, yeah, it's, it's, it's automatically included. If, you, uh, if your company bought uh, the product design and manufacturing collection, it's included as part of your subscription to that. Um, it's, it's a freebie. It's nothing extra you have to buy. It's part of your purchase. You just may have to go and download it depending on your version. Any other questions kind of rolling in? There's one that just came in. Uh, when you have a subassembly, does it break it down to the components within a subassembly or is it treated as a single part? It's treated on how you select it. So if you use the select method, whether it's a subassembly or not, it's only working with what you select, regardless of your modeling structure. So let's say you're working in a sub of a sub of the top level but you need two pieces out of the sub sub, you need one piece out of the sub and one piece out of the top level. It ignores that structure because you're picking what the pieces are. So assembly structure doesn't play into this. It doesn't, it doesn't restrict it uh, based on that. It restricts it based on what you select. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right, if you happen to think of any questions after the webinar has ended, by all means, uh, get in contact with us. Uh, your Hagerman sales rep will be happy to forward any questions along. Um, I believe this video will also be posted to our Hagerman page and to 
our YouTube channel. Uh, I believe you can post questions in there and it somehow gets to us some magical way of the internet. Um, aside from that, that's all I have for today. I appreciate everybody joining us and I hope you found it informative. Hey, Kendred, I've got one yes. more question for you. Okay, bring it. Uh, when you're when you're changing the min-max tolerances inside the analysis engine, can you push those back to the model? Not that I am aware of because what you're doing in the analysis engine is you're overriding the values that are pulled from the piece parts. So if you have certain values you've came up with, and that's why you get the report and the breakdown, if you have certain values you have come up with that work, you have to go back to the piece parts and invoke and apply those tolerances there. Anything else? There's a couple more that just came in. I think we can handle them offline with a direct email. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Again, I appreciate everybody joining us. I hope you find it informative. And if you need us, just give us a call.